All right, we will go ahead and open the hearing on House Bill 527. Representative, would you like to open on your bill? Chairs of the Cop, members of the committee, my name is Representative Lee Deming, uh, that is D-E-M-I-N-G. I represent the good people of House District 55 in and around Laurel. And with your permission, I do have a handout. Yes, that'd be fine, thank you. Members of the committee, uh, what you have there is just some information that we're going to be covering a little bit here in the, in the hearing. Um, I've got uh, some other copies if anybody would like some. Uh, <clears throat> I also have another fact sheet, um, like I said, if anybody in the audience would like that. So <clears throat> my, my appearance at the podium here today uh, began a couple of decades ago. Uh, I used to take students to D.C. and one of the places we always visit was uh, Arlington Cemetery. The first time I walked in there, uh, if you have been there, you can appreciate, I think, as I did, the sheer immensity of the sacrifices made on our behalf. Uh, my, my reaction on entering the main gate was sorrow. So much so that I tried to hide my emotions. I'm not really good about that. When I finally looked up, the first headstone that I uh, focused in on, first headstone I read was a man by the name of Jaeger from Montana. Of the hundreds of thousands of headstones, that was the first one I focused on. After sorrow came pride and then gratitude, I decided if there was anything I could ever do to express my appreciation for these sacrifices, I would do it. And here I am. I come before you as an advocate for the men and women of the Montana National Guard, Montana Air Guard, to repay them for their service by asking that we, together, require the letter and the spirit of the Constitution be followed with regard to their service. It is the least we can do. Nothing in the bill prevents the governor or the president from calling up the National Guard for domestic or foreign deployments. All of the functions the National Guard performs like support in case of floods or fires or rescues are still available. All except for combat operations overseas absent a congressional declaration of war. Everything else is on the table. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11 of the U.S. Constitution reads, the Congress shall have the power to declare war. With complete clarity in that document, the framers vested the power to declare war in the U.S. Congress. They did this deliberately, specifically prohibiting the president from declaring war and for good reason. It has taken teams of lawyers and generations of bad civics teachers to obscure that simple principle. Today, the National Guard is composed or is considered the militia, and although there is tension between those two terms, for our purposes, the militia and the National Guard will be synonymous. Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1. The President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15. The Congress shall have the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. That's it. These three things only, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. So, Congress declares war, the President prosecutes it. The President commands the Army and Navy and the militia when called into the actual service of the United States. The Congress provides for calling forth a militia for three things. Execute the laws of the Union. Suppress insurrections and repel invasions. And 
any other use is unconstitutional. That's it. That's my argument. The U.S. has not declared war since 1942, when President Franklin Roosevelt asked for a declaration of war from the Congress on Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. He asked for this declaration because he believed it improper to engage in hostilities against the country without a formal war declaration. He believed it improper. As everyone knows, the U.S. has prosecuted wars without the constitutionally required declarations many times since 1942. Two of the most recent of those were, wars were in Iraq and Afghanistan, wars in which Montana Guardsmen participated. I would like to address one argument against the bill that I have heard. Some, some opponents of this bill believe that supporters are using the National Guard as pawns. I've heard that. In fact, my primary motivation in bringing this bill is to defend the Guard from being used in this way. Madam Chair, members of the committee, in the interest of time and with the indulgence of the chair, I will share with you just a couple more items for now. I submit to you today that over 482 members of the Army National Guard died in Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. 36 of those are from Montana. I'm not the one using them as pawns. On January 20th at noon, I met with someone very high up in the National Guard about this bill. In that meeting, I learned a lot. In the course of conversation, it came up that we haven't declared war since World War II. The reply was, we just don't do it that way anymore. This bill is a pro-veteran and pro-constitution bill. For now, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I will sit for questions and look forward to a good hearing. Thank you, Representative Deming. Um, just another reminder for everyone here today, we do have time constraints for testimony, so we will do 15 minutes proponents, 15 minutes opponents. Um, if you are here and you don't get the opportunity to testify, you're more than welcome to submit written testimony either here in person or online. So with that, we'll go to proponents in the room, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Christopher Ingett, that's E-N-G-E-T. I'm the Strategic Director for Concerned Veterans for America, but I am here today representing myself. I was a former member of the Montana Army National Guard deployed to Afghanistan in 2012. I'm a lifetime member of the Disabled American Veterans and the Military Order of the Purple Heart, uh, and a former uh, post commander of American Legion Post 117. And today I support this bill. Uh, I wanna tell a little bit about my history. I joined the military at 17 years old. Uh, in July of 2007, I was brought on to coordinate military funeral honors on the eastern side of Montana, and over the course of the next seven years, I coordinated over 1,100 military funeral honors for, for wounded in action, killed in action, and those um, that were former service members. Um, we did that over and over and over again. We did it with honor, we did it with distinction. But there's a, there was many times doing, doing funerals for those that, were, those that were wounded or killed in action where I watched a four-year-old son look at the casket being lowered into the ground and ask, when, my, when is my dad coming home? Many, many, many times this doesn't just affect a veteran that goes to combat and serves in these wars and serves honorably. It affects their families, it affects their children, it affects their parents. On June 26th of 2012, I, I was deployed with the uh, 44th Military Police in Kandahar, Afghanistan, of the Montana Army National Guard. 
and I was injured when an RPG, a rocket propelled grenade, detonated five feet from where I was in a tent. It flipped my life upside down. I came home not knowing what the future would hold. My kids were unsure of what was going on. I no longer was a soldier. I no longer was in the military. I no longer had a purpose. We see over and over and over again the brave men and women that have signed on the dotted line and swore, swore an oath to our country to sacrifice everything, including their life for it, where it's affecting their families but not actually creating peace around our country and peace around the world. We see it happen over and over and over, and just not that long ago, we watched the 75,000 members of the Taliban sweep across the country of Afghanistan. 20 years in that country, multiple lives lost, many from this great state of Montana, and we did not create peace in that country. We did not do what we had set out to do, and nation building, which is what our military never should do. Congress has abdicated its responsibility to take this sacrifice Madam seriously. Chairman, Vice Chair Galloway. I don't mean to interrupt, but in the essence of time, we really need to keep to points in the bill. Vice Chair Galloway, I feel this is relevant to the bill. I believe that Congress must declare war if they want to send our men and women into combat and into harm's way. No longer using authorizations of use of military force, but actively declaring war. And I support this bill because it ensures that our men and women from the great state of Montana and their sacrifice will actually be used for something that is going to be beneficial to our state, our country, and this world. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next proponent in the room, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Darren Gobb. Last name is spelled G-A-U-B. I also have some handouts if I can. Yes, that'd be fine. Thank you. So on behalf of an organization called Restore Liberty, veteran founded by myself and Brigadier General Retired Blaine Holt, Montana's for Limited Government, which is veteran run, the Montana Freedom Caucus and the Global Veterans Coalition, which I founded. I've written a six page testimony here, but uh, all of this is in support of this bill. And I've received notes from around the country and have published this as an article to about uh, five different national outlets and a bunch across Montana as well. My background is as a seven deployment combat veteran from ta tactical to national strategic level covering 28 years of service. I started out my army career conducting those funerals in Arlington Cemetery to the total of about 600 or more. Came back to Montana after retirement and did 2,000 more funerals as, a, as the coordinator for those funerals across this state. I've buried my family, my friends, and far too many soldiers that I know. Uh, I've commanded up to the Army Brigade level, 3,500 soldiers, 115 aircraft, and worked at the national strategic level for many years. My final job was running a large aviation task force across six countries in, in Eastern Europe. Also spent four years in Afghanistan, one in South Korea, and, and one in North Africa. And now work numerous grassroots effort, including constitutional education. You've already heard about what this bill is and what it does, why it is needed. We've expended blood and treasure in expeditionary conflicts from the Korean War to Syria today, which is still ongoing. This is how Rome operated. This is not how America operates. This bill is, or excuse me, the foundation of this bill is simple. The U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 is very clear. There is no argument against it. That power has never been delegated. The Supremacy Clause in the laws that must be constitutional to be supreme. If they're not constitutional, they're not supreme, and they can be discarded. The Tenth Amendment, which was written after the Supremacy Clause to give the states the predominant powers. You've already heard about the Guard and the Militia. The authorized use of military force is not even really a legal term. It was an excuse for Congress to abdicate their power to the President. The War Powers Resolution of 1973 is the same, and I can promise you the 92-day window that is buried in the, in the uh, War Powers Resolution, I can move entire forces from the Army overseas, and they'll be in the thick of a fight that, they're, that you can't extract from, and Congress can't just pull the funding. It's too late. They need the declaration before they leave. Quickly running through some arguments you may hear that are not valid. Threats to close military bases. That's a bullying tactic. It won't happen, and Malmstrom will not close. It's got a national strategic mission, and it's not up to the executive and DOD to close bases. This is far more complicated of a process. I've been through it twice. National security. The real risk is in continuing to ignore the clear requirements of the Constitution. Congress can meet and vote quickly if needed. This is only for overseas combat. 
not for normal National Guard duty stateside and Homeland Security. The courts have ruled as well, only for overseas peaceful training missions can they deploy without a declaration of war. Funding and equipment res restrictions, bullying tactics and distractions, that's all they are. This is about Congress and the constitutional requirement to declare war, nothing else. There's been an argument this does not conform to the Constitution. In fact, that is the entire point. We have not conformed to the Constitution for years. It's time that we start doing that. And it's at the state's level and the governors who have to enforce it. The highest principle here is, and the most important, is that this entire debate is that of adhering to the Constitution and its clearly defined dictates. Congress alone declares war, the president executes the war, that's it, nothing has superseded that in American history, except for some of our own apathy, and I'm guilty too. The last thing I'll say is the oath of office. To all currently in uniform and those who've worn our military uniform in the past, all others who've recited an oath of office containing these or similar words, I do solemnly swear I will support and defend the Constitution. I will bear true faith and allegiance. We are sworn to support and defend the Constitution not a president, not a Congress, not a defense industry, not a budget or a funding source or anything else. We are not to be bribed and coerced and to support this bill is to fulfill our oaths. And all in this room who wear or have worn the uniform must support it as that is what our oath requires. We are duty bound to do what is right, not what is convenient. It's called leadership. All who would fight this bill would cast aside their oaths and their words then mean nothing to me. Thank you, and I'll be willing to stand for questions. I'll stand outside though and be available. If I ask for a due pass, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gobb. Next proponent in the room, please. And we do have about six and a half minutes left for gotcha. proponents. Madam Chair and committee, my name is Sid Dowd, D-A-O-U-D. I am a Kalispell City Councilman and what I'm saying here today does not necessarily reflect the views or policy of the city of Kalispell. I'm also the chair of the MTLP and I'll be speaking on that behalf. That's the Montana Libertarian Party. I'm an Army vet, a FIST team member, which translates to a field artillery forward observer. I'm also a medic. Um, I did, served as a medic during the end of my term. We're simply asking Congress to do its job. I think we all yearn in Montana to go back to adhering to the Constitution, and that's exactly what we're attempting to do here. Our U.S. warfighters in a combat situation are not there because they're fighting for the president. They're not there because they're fighting for the government. They're there because they're fighting for their unit, their buddy next to them in the foxhole, and the people back home. We're trying to reincorporate the people back home into this decision as our Congress represents the people back home. I've heard a lot of interesting uh, opposition to this due to funding, that the possibility that the federal government could pull funding. And my question that I would like to pose to you in closing is, what is the price to be unconstitutional? What, what's that number? Ask yourselves that. Thank you for this opportunity, Madam Chair. I appreciate that, and I'll stand for questions in the hallway. Thank you. Next proponent, please. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chairman and Committee, Ray Southworth, S-O-U-T-H-W-O-R-T-H. -H. Uh, I joined the Army in 1972 as an airborne paratrooper at 101st Airborne. Uh, I enlist, I volunteered for Vietnam three times, but uh, my unit was just coming back. They were decimated. They were animals. And then uh, I went over to Italy as a NATO force, worked with all the NATO people over there, Belgium, uh, England, um, Germany, um, and so forth. And uh, we trained with them. And so I believe in the North <laughs> NATO. I believe in it. So as a concerned Montana boy, raised here, native all my life. Um, I asked the question, why? Why are, we, uh, why are we against this? And I got an email from the Legion saying oppose. Why? 
have that right to ask that question? Couldn't get an answer. Finally got one. It says call this uh, Hornig or something, and uh, and I did, but I couldn't get couldn't get we couldn't touch base. So I just wanted to ask him why. So my question is, you really believe that we shouldn't follow the the, the um, what what our forefathers brought in the Constitution? You really believe our presidents, our presidents? They're four-year wonders. We have no leadership. We don't know what leadership is. Maybe Eisenhower. I'm serious. It's scary. We've got politicians trying to be running Afghanistan. A total disaster exiting that. Left 20,000 or more people, our allies. Same thing in Iraq, same thing in Vietnam, and we keep doing it. And how long are we going to stay there? This is why we need this bill. Guess what? COVID. How good was COVID? Without these guys, they were so good. They ran that thing like an army camp or air force camp or marine camp. It was, we went right through there, got our shots. It was amazing. On the fires at Roundup, they were there for looters, checking the roads. What if we had a railroad accident, and, we, and I worked for the railroad, with hazardous waste like we did in the, in the other state there? They would be involved. We need them. But when it's called, I'm sure Congress can work with the governor, and the governor can work with the president. I bet it will work. I don't think we're asking too much. But defund hogwash. You, 50 states, you look at the flag, there's 50 stars on that flag. I tell it to those kids all the time when I go to the school. What does those 50 stars mean? Unity! We got none. It's all politics. We got to start working together for the common good of Montana and the rest of the people. I, I swear that's why I'm here. So I'm for this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, members, we're going to do something a little different. And at the request of the sponsor, we will hear from Dan McKnight online, please. And we do have um, about a minute left. So if you could just keep it quick. Madam Chair, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. I will be fast. Uh, my name is Dan McKnight. I'm the chairman of a growing national veterans organization made up of global war on terror veterans who have returned from undeclared war. You know, I'm, I'm actually watching this hearing and I'm in awe of, of some of the people that have spoken. But in politics, we have all come to expect some level of hypocrisy, some element of two-faced, forked-tongued duplicity. And as sad as it may be, most people just shrug their shoulders and try to ignore the circus that's become our federal government. But every once in a while, the rank stench becomes so bad that it can't be ignored. When that happens, the only thing to do is to call it out and expose it to the sunlight of public inspection in hopes that the light will cleanse the people of this nasty virus. Nearly every person in this hearing room <clears throat> has sworn an oath to the Constitution to defend it from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Some took the oath as an enlisted man or woman, some as officers, some Mr. as elected McKnight, officials. That's all the time that we have for today. If you could um, just close your remarks, please. Certainly, this bill is simple, Madam Chair. Um, the fact that it's opposed by generals and legion commanders but supported by the rank and file speaks volumes. I swore an oath to defend the Constitution, every single word of it, and you did too, and I hope that you'll pass with a, uh, with a recommendation to pass. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll return to our proponents in the room, um, but if you could just come to the podium, state your name, and that you are for the bill. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, if you feel compelled to write testimony and submit it to the committee, that will be distributed to all of us. So no testimony right now? Nope, just your name and that you're for the bill. Uh, DeAndre Ramsey, and I'm for the bill. And could you spell your last name, please? R-A-M-S-E-Y. First name is D-E-O-N-D-R-A-I. Thank you. And then also um, where you're from or if you're representing anyone. Excuse me? Uh, where you're from and if you're representing someone or if you're on behalf of yourself. I'm here on behalf of myself as okay. a veteran. Okay, thank you. Okay, next proponent, please. 
Madam Chair, Representative Caleb Pinkle, um, House Sister 68, Belgrade. I just want to state for the record that I served as 11 Charlie Indirect Fire Infantry in the Montana Army National Guard for six years and just wondering if I can turn in my testimony. Strong, Thank strong you. support. Thank you. Next proponent, please. My name is Tom Jandron, J-A-N-D-R-O-N. I recently retired from the Montana Army National Guard as an E-7 in the aviation unit, and I strongly support this bill. Thank you. Next proponent, please. Hi. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Heidi, like the book, Friedlander, spelled like Friedlander. I am a Marine Corps veteran, Army nurse, wife of a Montana National Guard member after he retired after 23 years, and I'm a proponent of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent, please. Patrick Webb here on behalf of myself today, WEBB. I have t written testimony I'd like to submit with your permission, Madam Chair. Yes, that'd be great. Thank you. Members of the, uh, Madam Chair, members of the, members of the committee, uh, my name is Leslie Soule, S-O-U-L-E, and I would like to um, uh, urge do pass. Thank you. Next proponent. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Liam McCollum, M-C-C-O-L-L-U-M, and I have a writ written testimony and a handout, if I may. Hand yes, that'd be fine. Thank you. Next proponent, please. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Dustin Scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, from Helena, Montana, and I strongly urge you to vote in favor of HB 527. Thank you. Next proponent, please. Chair Zolnikoff, members of the committee, my name is Keegan Medrano, that's M-E-D-R-A-N-O, and I'm here representing the American Civil Liberties Union of Montana to urge a yes vote on HB 527. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Representative Jedediah Hinkle. I represent House District 67 in Belgrade, and I am representing myself as an individual who took that oath of the office to defend our Constitution in order to do pass. And Madam Chair, may I be excused? Yes, you may. Thank, Thank you. you. Next proponent, please. Madam Chair, honorable members, my name is Jared Frerichs, spelled F-R-E-R. I C H S. I'm from Billings, Montana. I'm a lobbyist on here on my own behalf as a veteran, and I stand in support that you urge do pass, and I'll be available for questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have further proponents in the room? Do we have any proponents in the hall? I doubt they could hear the TV. Hi, my name is Drana Coaster, Madam Chair, members of the committee, D-R-U-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, last name K-O-E-S-T-E-R, and I very, very much approve of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. All right, seeing no further proponents in the room, we will move to opponents in the room, please. Oh, sorry, um, I think we have more <laughs> um, proponents online, so we'll now move to our proponents online. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Chelsea Culpon, C-U-L-P-O-N. I am a voter, taxpayer, and homeschooling mother of four in Helena. I have uh, one son who, from the earliest age of three or four, decided he wanted to be, wanted to be a P-51 pilot. Sorry, Ms. Culpon, we only have time for people to state their name oh. and that they're for the bill. Um, but if you have testimony, please feel free to submit it online. No, thank you. I'm a proponent. Thank, thank you. you. Next online proponent, please. My name is Lucretia Humphrey, H-U-M-P-H-R-E-Y. I'm a proponent of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next proponent, please. Hi, my name is Scott Horton. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute and uh, I was asked to come and speak today uh, by my friends from bringourtroopshome.us and defendtheguard.us. And uh, I am 
very strongly in favor of this bill and I'll submit my testimony online. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll next go to Dale Gann, please. I'm Dale Gann and I'm with Adam soon and we are in support of this bill. Thank you. Next online proponent. My name is Elena Gagliano, G-A-G-L-I-A-N-O, and I'm a proponent of HB 527. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further proponents online, we'll now go to opponents in the room. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. I do have a, a few handouts, if I could, please. Yes, that'd be all right. Thank you. Thank you. A good uh, afternoon, Madam Chair, and uh, members of the Energy, Technology, and Federal Regulation Committee. Um, I am Major General J. Peter Ronick, H-R-O-N-E-K, and the Adjutant General for the Montana National Guard and the Director of the Department of Military Affairs. Uh, a little background, I've been appointed for the last two years as your, as your uh, Adjutant General. Uh, my career has over 38 years uh, in the Air Force. I have served over 4,200 hours uh, flying uh, F-16s, F-15s, uh, and C-130 aircraft, three combat tours uh, in Iraq and Saudi Arabia, Southwest Asia, uh, and, uh, and then since coming back, uh, mainly spent the rest of my career in uh, Great Falls as a wing commander, and then uh, the last, before we became Adjutant General, in Washington, D.C. as a plans, programs, and requirements uh, director for the Air National Guard with the Air, United States Air Force, working for structure and, and budgeting issues for, the, uh, for our national defense. Again, appointed by Governor GM42 years ago, I am here in opposition to House Bill 527. And I, will, I hope to show you today that while the intent behind this bill might be noble, uh, if passed, you would put your, your National Guard, your Montana National Guard at risk uh, de defending your state and nation. A little history, the, or the origins of the National Guard began in, in 1636 when the first militias of the North America was treated in Massachusetts. Throughout the years, the National Guard has grown to a, the robust and well-equipped force it is today. In 1903, Congress passed the Militia Act, which required the states to train their forces in accordance with federal standards in exchange for the federal government providing equipment and funding to the militias. Adhering to the federal training standards helped our nation be more ready for war. The Militia Act of 1903 also created the organized militia, which is known as the National Guard. The National Defense Act of 1916 uh, designated the state's organized militias as the primary combat reserve forces of the Army. It is required that the organized militias receive federal funding, uh, funding be called the National Guard. And finally, the National Guard Mobilization Act of 1933 required that the members of the state National Guard enlist or hold commissions in the federal Army. The National Guard today serves as the Combat Ready Reserve of the Armed Forces and constitutes a significant portion of the total combat power and sustainment of the Armed Forces. The Montana National Guard continues a long and storied history of the citizen soldiers, and it proves exceptional value to both Montana and our nation. And we know that many of your Montanans have paid the ultimate sacrifice, which we are called to duty. My forces are also well trained and equipped as their active duty counterparts at a fraction of the cost and the state gets a significant benefit from the Guard, which I will discuss here shortly. The U.S. Congress, the US Congress powers, power over the organized militia is found in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 and 16, as is the case with many of Congress's powers, and the power to call forth the organized militia has been delegated to the President and the Secretary of Defense because today the National Guard is a combat ready reserve component of the armed forces of the United States. So look at the chart there. I have provided, uh, the, not the fold out, but the chart. I provided a chart to explain these instances in which the National Guard can be mobilized into active duty, both domestically and overseas. The proponents of House Bill 52 argue that Congress cannot delegate its power to call forth, but I will hit a few instances what they have. If you look at it, the top is what is in, in the bill is, is a declaration of war. And at the bottom is state active duty. So those are kind of two. Everything in between has been delegated by Congress 
to um, activate the, the reserve component. You may or may not like those rules, but that's what all reserve components, when called to duty, and is a lawful order. So when I receive this as a lawful order from our civilian government and from what's been delegated by Congress, I must follow. I don't think anybody in this room would want us not to just say, well, I don't feel like following that today. You expect one called to duty by a lawful order, we will respond and do our best and basically uh, take and, and, and defend our nation to it, our utmost abilities that we have to include the ultimate sacrifice. These statutes are lawful orders they must follow. Proponents say this uh, cannot, this is false. The United States Supreme Court has held many times throughout our history that Congress can delegate its powers to the executive branch and its agencies. This is well settled. On a point in this case, U.S. Supreme Court held in the 1990 Supreme Court case Purpose versus the Department of Defense that governors could not withhold consent for activation of the National Guard overseas because of an objection to the location, purpose, type, or schedule of such active duty. Central to Purpose is the fact that members of the state of National Guard are also members of the armed forces of the United States and can be activated under the authorities listed on the chart I provided you. The governor's power over the state militia ceases once the National Guard is activated because they are in federal military. The proponent also argues that for military force to be used overseas, that the U.S. Constitution requires a formal declaration of war. This again is false. Since our nation's founding, force has been used by the U.S. presidents without a declaration of war and almost contemporary to our nation's, our nation's second, constitution, second constitution ratified in 1788. Alexander Ham Hamilton argued that if the United States is attacked, it is already at war, and is not required for Congress to declare war. Congress seemed to agree with Hamilton's view and issued a limited authorization for the use of force from the United States to seize all vessels and goods in the, in the Bay of Tripoli. The limited authorization of the Bay of Tripoli, short of a declaration of war, was upheld as a constitutional in 1800s in the case of Boss versus Tingey, where the Supreme Court held that Congress need not declare war in the all-out sense. In fact, by the, in the War of 1812, which was the first instance where it was declared by Congress, the United States had been involved in six military actions in foreign territories. The United States has engaged in an additional 26 military actions in overseas and areas by time the next war was declared by, in 1846 against Mexico and, 30, and another 39 instances of military action before our nation's third declaration of war with Spain in 1898. By 2020, 2020, force has been used overseas 176 times, and Congress has declared war 11 times. My, my drug advocate also has a congressional research article that would, if you want it, we, you can request that from me and we can get that to you, of our history uh, for you to review. The argument that force cannot be used overseas in the absence of declaration war is false. The Supreme Court in our history indicates that if the proponents uh, the Supreme Court in our history indicates this. If the proponents would like to change the Constitution or the way the military forces are used overseas, it should work with the federal government, not at the state. If forces to be used overseas uh, to do that. Because right now, just by Montana saying we are not going to use our forces uh, for combat operations, we would be backdooring what we say, and that would put us at risk in Montana because all other states are still following the, the laws that have been passed by Congress, where we would be saying no to that. So even though I might be kind of saying these are rules that we should not follow anymore until those are changed, I have to follow those rules. If our state says they will not follow it, we'll be one of the one of the 54 states and territories that will be saying no. This has been brought forward uh, to uh, other state legislators, but none have passed. If House Bill 52 is passed, it will put our state and nation at risk. The Department of Defense will most likely move my missions, equipment, military pay, and facilities to the Reserve Army Reserve or the Ar Air Force Reserve, or other states, National Guards that don't have these these. Uh, these defend the guard, or I would say defund the guard bills. Because we, because of the, the laws that are in place, they can't utilize us for operations that they think they, think they need. Uh, they will need to move it where it's more accessible. And because of my tr time in Washington, D.C., I have seen movement of, of, of that to make sure we're accessible. And I know that would be a fact. 
The Department of Defense could also pull the, pull the recognition of Montana's organized militia because that system that exists today requires that to receive the federal funding, equipment, and recognition, it must comply with all federal laws and training standards, which could include mobilizing in support of a presidential call to duty. Practically, I would, like, I would lack the equipment or facilities to train, prepare, or respond for domestic or international crises that pose a security or safety risk to our nation and state if this bill were to pass. For example, right now, I would like the equipment and resources to conduct missions on the southwest border, which we are currently engaged because those resources would be pulled. I would like the resources to rescue Montanans from the Yellowstone River or fight fire to save life because those helicopter missions would be pulled. I would not have a trained forces equipment to deploy for any overseas attack like 9-11 also. The economic impact will also be a significant, even though that is probably not the focus, but it would be a fact. If you look in your trifold, it says economic impact, you will see that um, the, the, the amount of monies that we currently get annually, okay, for payroll and salaries paid by the federal government is $176 million a year. Operates and maintenance of our facilities is over $27 million a year because we would not be able to go to the current laws that are currently in place. Unfortunately, Hospital Factory Center does, does the opposite of defending the guard, it defunds it, it puts our state and nation at risk. I would like to point out that there is a legal note prepared by the legislative services that call into question House Bill 527 legality. I want to leave you with this. Your 3,500 soldiers and airmen are proud and willing to do the ultimate sacrifice. The last two years, we've had over 1,000 have been deployed overseas for combat, humanitarian, and peacekeeping operations, and over 1,000 have been engaged in state active duty. You should be honored, and I know you're proud of them. Your, your National Guard has sworn to defend the U.S. and the Montana Constitution against all enemies of domestic, and your, your all-volunteer military force follows lawful orders, which I've shown out to you. If those are to be changed, it needs to be changed at the national level, not just one state saying we're not going to participate. And your National Guard, again, is, is proud and honored to serve this great state and nation. We do not need to be defended. Our job is to protect and defend you. And that's what you want. So when you go to sleep at night to know at home or abroad, if called under whatever lawful order is out there, we as a nation, we will participate the same as any other state. I have Major Todd Wayne here, my stud judge advocate, who can provide any information, information and also Miss Sunday West, my deputy, on anything of impact to the uh, Department of Military Affairs. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next opponent in the room, please. And we do only have about three minutes left. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Mike Talia, T-A-L-I-A, -A, representing the American Legion Department of Montana, and we oppose House Bill 527. I'm a lawyer by trade and a veteran of some of the expeditionary operations at which this bill is aimed, and for many years I was the Montana National Guard's lawyer. Now I'm in private practice. There's a lot of good intention behind this bill, but the bare fact of it is, is that it flies in the face of the Constitution because the states are limited to the appointment of officers and training the militia in accordance with the discipline prescribed by Congress. The history of the National Guard that led us to the point where we are today comes out of the Spanish-American War, and we have the Militia Acts, including the Dick Act, and there was a grand bargain struck. Congress says, we will pay for these forces, states. You can have all of this stuff, but we're not paying for it for your fires and floods. We're paying for it so that we can use it for the national defense. And that was the lesson we learned after the Spanish-American War. One point on the legal note, I do believe the statute that is discussed there is not the right statute. This bill is aimed at Section uh, 12301 in Title 10, United States Code. That's the statute that allows governors to have the ability to not consent to the deployment of forces. Why do governors not have the ability to consent? Because Congress gave it to them. And, that comes from the Constitution. So the American Legion, Department of Montana, asks you to vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Next opponent in the room, please. Madam Chair, Honorable Vice Chair Galloway, my name and members of the committee, my name is Joe Fletcher, J-O-E-F-L-E-T-C-H-E-R. I'm a United States Air Force retiree. I reside in Great Falls, Montana, and I'm a veteran of the Vietnam War. And I'm representing the Department of Montana, Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States of America. Let me state it this time, that every member 
of the veterans of foreign wars of the United States is a combat veteran or they have served in a combat area which they were subject to being injured, killed at any moment. I know, I've been there. I learned how to roll out of a bed and pull my mattress over me as I went on the floor and prayed to God that I'd make it through that attack. So this bill, we, the VFW of Montana, oppo we oppose this, vehemently oppose it. We think it's wrong, wrong for the state, wrong for our nation. And I'm just gonna make a side note for personal. Just a few minutes ago, there was a gentleman here in this room that was a veteran. And I was deeply offended when he slandered my oath, my loyalty to this great nation. I'm offended by it, and I would never in a million years would I slander another veteran. I might disagree with them, but I would never slander their honor, their loyalty to this great nation. Thank you. God bless Montana and the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. That is all the time we have for opponent testimony today. So if there are further opponents in the room, please state your name at the podium. Yes, ma'am. Madam Chairman, my name is Bill White. Last name is W-H-I-T-E. My job with the Legion is to is a liaison to the governor, and I'm against this bill. There has been gentlemen up here speaking. Mr. White, um, we don't have time for any more no. uh, testimony. Thank you. Uh, next opponent in the room, please state your name. Madam Chairman, uh, Dwayne Cunningham, C-U-N-N-I-N-G-H-A-M. I'm the adjutant for the American Legion of Montana. I am a opponent of this bill as it is written. Thank you. Thank you. Further opponents in the room? Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Lowell Long, L-O-N-G. I am a almost 24 year member of the National Guard, deployed to Iraq once and I oppose this bill. Thank you. Further opponents? Seeing no further opponents in the room, if you are an opponent online, please raise your hand. We'll start with Roger Hagan, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please state your name. Madam Chair, for the record, Roger Hagan, last name spelled H-A-G-A-N, and I represent the Montana National Guard Officer Association, the Montana National Guard Enlisted Association, and I uh, am uh, in opposition to this House bill. We urge your do not pass, thank you. Thank you. Next opponent online, please. Uh, Madam Chair and committee, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Um, my name is Richard Liebert, spelled L-I-E-B-E-R-T, cattle rancher in Cascade County. Retired Army Colonel, 40 years service, active guard and reserve, and six proudly spent in the Montana Army National Guard, and this bill would be better put as a resolution and demand Congress do its job. I agree with the sponsor, but I think it'd be better as a resolution and don't leave it as a bill that would cripple the Montana National Guard. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further opponents online, we will move to informational witnesses in the room, please. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Major Todd A. Wayne, that's spelled T-O-D-D. -D. Last name is spelled W-A-Y-N-E. I am the Deputy Statute Advocate of the Montana National Guard. I'm one of Major General Ronick's attorneys over at Fort Harrison. I've been a judge advocate for 13 years and I have extensive backgrounds in national security law and kind of the issues that we've touched on today. If you have any questions on the differences between the AUMF and the Declaration of War, 
or kind of how the operational framework exists with the militia and the federal army, I can answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you. Next informational witness, please. Uh, Madam Chair, member of the, of the committee, my name is Sunday West, spelled W-E-S-T. I'm Deputy Director for the Department of Military Affairs. Um, military Affairs is somewhat connected with the, the guards, so if there's any questions uh, how this will impact the department, um, I'm available. Thank you. Seeing no further informational witnesses in the room, do we have informational witnesses online? No, Madam Chair. Okay, we will move to questions from the committee. Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this question will be for Major Wayne. Major Wayne. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Representative. Thank you, Major Wayne. Uh, uh, this is a very emotional topic, and I understand why so many people feel that way. Uh, I'm 100% disabled veteran myself, a lifetime member of the Disabled American Veterans VFW, American Legion, when I was active duty. So when I signed up, I understood that I was going to be possibly sent, well, I was on submarines, of course, I'm being sent overseas. But the question is, is as a Guard member, during the recruitment process, are people fully aware of the opportunity that they will have to be deployed. Madam Chair, Representative, uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone for their service, including yours and everyone that spoke here today. Um, since 1933, uh, members of the organized militia, the Montana National Guard or any state's National Guard, have held two statuses. Uh, one, they're in the state militia, and then two, they're in the federal army or air force. So during that process of enlistment, uh, yes, Representative, Madam Chair, uh, they take oaths and they explain the entire process of serving in the military. They go through the same training as their active duty counterparts and are called uh, on many, many times to serve just like active duty. Thank you. Further questions from the committee? Uh, Representative Cordham. Thank you, Madam Chair, for Major General Ronick, please. Major General Ronick. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Cardin. Madam Chair, Major General, can you uh, describe the impact this bill would have on our disaster response um, in our state? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Cardin, um, it would have several fold. Um, if you wanted to use this for state active duty, uh, the numbers were probably diminished because I probably would not have the missions or the equipment to recruit to a, a certain level. So I would imagine that force structure would move out of state, so that would broad down the manpower. So for any kind of military active duty, that number would do. But most more impactful instantly would happen is if the missions were to move, they would take the helicopters, uh, the uh, vehicles, other equipment would move out. So you would not have that support system there uh, for that. So you would have just a diminished force and maybe limited equipment unless the governor decides or, or the state appropriates funding for equipment uh, that it is currently paid for on the federal government. So that's where you would see the impact, but uh, you would not have the helicopter rescues or, or, or any kind of the security that you would probably want. Thank you, Major General, Madam Chair. Further questions, Representative Fielder. Madam Chair, I have a question for Mr. Dan McKnight, if he's still online. Mr. Dan McKnight. Yes, I'm here. Madam Chair, Mr. McKnight, uh, we've heard that there's a real threat that we would see equipment and, uh, and funding and training and stuff moved out of Montana if this bill was to pass. Is there a real threat in your opinion, sir? Madam Chair, Representative, thank you for the question. I believe that the threat is a, it's a paper tiger. There is no po political mechanism for defunding the National Guard. The National Guard is bound by certain rules and restrictions. In Title 32, they have to maintain their state mission, their state readiness in order to receive federal funds. And if they abdicate that responsibility under Title 32, the, the federal government can pull funding. This bill has nothing to do with Title 32. This is only about Title 10, which deals with foreign overseas combat deployments or foreign overseas training missions. So I don't believe that, that's a, that there's any political 
um, machine that would defund the state's National Guard because it would affect readiness and it would uh, affect actual defense of the country in the, in the time of a, an attack. Thank you, Mr. McKnight. Madam Chair. Further questions from the committee? Okay, seeing no further questions, would the sponsor wish to close? I would, Madam Chair. Uh, did, before we go any farther, uh, did we get an amendment on this? Because I suggested an amendment um, to uh, new section two. Yes, Representative, we have the amendment in front of us. Oh, you do? Okay, excellent. We do, yes, thank so you. So uh, we just want to make it absolutely perfectly clear to everybody that uh, uh, none of the missions except for combat operations overseas without a declaration of war uh, are prohibited by this. Okay, so what that amendment does is I think that makes that crystal clear. And so um, as we move forward with this bill, we'd like to, we certainly like to, um, and I requested the amendment, obviously it's a friendly amendment. Okay, so that's one of the things that I wanted to make sure we, we covered. I kind of forgot about that earlier. All right, so uh, there's a couple of things I'd like to f finish up with here. Um, and I've actually heard this a couple of times. You know, uh, Montana hasn't, you know, if, if we were to pass this, we would be the first state in the union to pass this. And I've heard from some folks uh, that Montana can't be first. You know, if this is gonna happen, we can't be first. And I, I just wonder about that. You know, why not? Uh, Montana has been first in a lot of things. And I think this is a great idea. And I think it honors the sacrifices that these people have made for us. And so why not be the first in a nation to do this and have the other states follow? Uh, and I also think that that's, we're trying to, um, probably the most delicate way of saying this, are we really trying to avoid risk? Is that what is that what we're doing here? You know, all of this stuff is risky. I, I think the very first time I heard that was in a conversation with somebody in the halls of this uh, Capitol. And the first thing I thought of was those guys jumping off those uh, landing crafts at Normandy. I mean, I used to tell my kids that story over and over again. Uh, talk about courage. And those men didn't know that there was people who had already jumped out of airplanes the night before. Somebody had to go first. Why not Montana? I'll also point out that there's no fiscal note. You know, we've heard dire uh, uh, predictions that, you know, we lose all the money and all the training and everything. And um, I think if that were the case, there would have been a fiscal note. There is none. Someone in here brought up the fact that there was a legal note, and I, I actually, I think you should read it uh, if you have any doubts about the legality of this bill. Uh, that legal note, uh, which I responded to, answers all the questions that the uh, staff, the legal staff, put on there. And so read that so that you know that I, I'm not snowing you here. And a couple of things that were brought up uh, you know, the supremacy clause was in there, and, and this case that I'm going to talk about in a, sec uh, in a second is Perpich. And I think I, I spent more time on the legal, but I would like to talk to you about that uh, here for just a second. Supreme Court really hasn't um, addressed this issue. Yes, the Supreme Court has said that governors cannot uh, withdraw or withhold National Guard forces. Um, from overseas deployment for training only. That Perpich case that was uh, referenced earlier on, that only dealt with training, not combat overseas, absent a declaration of war. So again, um, I think I left that in one of the, the handouts that I gave you. If you want to read up on Perpich, that's exactly what it was, okay? I go into the supremacy clause, we don't have time. Uh, is this a threat to national security? 
The bill doesn't prohibit the Guard from being deployed to overseas combat. It simply asks that Congress pass a declaration of war before that happens. That doesn't affect national security at all. An invasion or an insurrection, yeah, we can deal with that immediately, and that's, that doesn't, isn't prohibited by this bill. It's under the existing constitution, the Montana Guard involvement is no way prohibited. Let's talk about the, uh, um, the money or uh, the training we would lose. Again, no fiscal note. This argument has been the most common. Will the Department of Defense withdraw the resources necessary for the, de uh, for the Montana Guard to complete its state and national missions? I think it's unlikely. It'd be politically untenable. No U.S. Congressperson is going to vote to do that, to defund their own uh, uh, National Guard forces. That's not going to happen. All this bill is asking is that if the Montana Guard is going to be used in combat overseas, that the Congress legitimize their participation by declaring war. That's all this is asking. This bill doesn't threaten Montana Guard's readiness. The reduction in readiness will come, if at all, from the national government's reaction to passage of this bill. Madam Chair, I'll uh, try to wrap up. I know you guys' time is limited. I apologize. Because we have done combat operations overseas without a declaration of war for so long, doesn't mean we should. Authorization for the use of military force, which is broad authority given to the president by the uh, Congress, is really an abdication of Congress, Congress's responsibility. The bill's contention is that if Congress has time to pass an authorization for the use of military force, it has time to follow the Constitution and authorize combat authorization, uh, operations with a declaration of war. They have time to do it. Is it reasonable to believe that the founders who deliberately left the question of bringing the country into a state of war to the Congress, not the President, would have intended one AUMF passed in 2001 to be an eternal blank check to the executive branch for combat operations. This is license, not a check on the executive branch. I have more, but I understand. I've got a committee to go to as well. <laughs> that will be there till about 8.30, I don't know, 9 o'clock. So I- Representative, we don't limit time limits for the opening and closing. I know, but I understand sponsors, you guys so. are tired. Um, I, I will go through my conclusion, and I promise it's short. My goal is not to send a message. That, that was never the goal for me. I don't, I know there are some other uh, folks that might have some some different goals in mind, or to force the national government to do anything. My goal with this bill is if the president decides to commit troops into combat without a constitutionally prescribed declaration of war that our Montana Guard be left to deal with the local emergencies that would inevitably occur there, that were referenced. We need him to do that. I read an article the other day that we've got uh, uh, drug cartels in Montana now that are, that are becoming a real threat. I'd kind of like to have the National Guard around. I, I have great confidence in those people. I hear them grinding away out there at night in the helicopters. That is a professional force, and I want them here to help us. If a crisis arises and the Congress decides to declare war, then I'm confident that our, our dedicated Guard members will answer the call with great professionalism and skill. There's no doubt in my mind. I think that's enough, uh, everybody. So uh, I thank you for a good hearing and thank you for uh, scheduling us. And I urge you to vote for this bill. Thank you, Representative Deming. This concludes the hearing on House Bill 527. We'll give a moment for the room to clear out.
Members, we're going to take a quick five minute break while we wait for our next bill sponsor. We will reconvene at 518 on the dot. Excellent. Members, we will now open executive action on House Bill 527. Madam Chair, I do move House Bill 527 do pass. Members, you've heard the motion by Vice Chair Galloway. Um, I believe there is an amendment for this bill. Vice Chair Galloway. <sighs> Madam Chair, we do move House Bill 527.1.1 amendment to pass. Members, you've heard the motion of the amendment. Is there discussion on the amendment? Uh, members, if I could just clarify, I believe this amendment was brought, um, can I see that? Yep. Just to, um, the only change in the language of the bill here is gonna be on page two, that's line 21. Um, it says performance of a hazardous service relating to an armed conflict. So the sponsor did mention this um, in his testimony, it is friendly. Um, and this was just to uh, provide some clarity to the language. So, is there a discussion on the amendment? Question. Question's been called. We'll do a voice vote for this one. All those in favor of amendment 527.1.1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the amendment goes on. Vice Chair Galloway. Madam Chair, I do move House Bill 527, once amended, do pass. Thank you. Is there discussion on the motion? Representative Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm going to be a no on this. I think that we are unfortunately treading in some extremely dangerous water here. The, it's uncharted. Nobody knows what will happen it, once we make this decision. As a former veteran, um, disabled veteran, I think that I've, everybody knows my credentials here. I believe that when you sign up, whether it's the Guard, the Reserve, active duty, you make a commitment, you know what you're signing up for. And for those reasons, I'm going to be a no. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, let's do a roll call vote on House Bill 527 is once amended. Representative Bishop? No. Representative Brewster? Yes. Representative Fielder? Yes, by proxy. Vice Chair Galloway? Yes. Representative Green? Yes. No. Representative Harvey? No. Representative Kazmaier? No. Representative Kmetz? Yes. Representative Knutson? Aye. Representative Cordum? No. Representative Phelan? Yes. Vice Chair Sullivan? No. Chair Zolnikov? Yes. Members, the motion carries seven to six. House Bill 527 will move to the floor. This concludes executive action on House Bill 527.